My name is Madeline Fairman. I'm 56 years old. I've been a registered nurse for 36 years at the Hamilton General Hospital. I've worked 30 years in the ICU. I'm married. I have one daughter and she's 25. I love my family. We're very close and we all live across the mountain, like blocks away from each other. We never went far from each other. And we're very tight, very tight, close knit family. I probably read hundreds of books a year. I love information, I love to learn, and I love working with people. I love, or that's why I went into nursing. I love working with and helping. <sighs> Initially in February of 2015, actually it was the 24th of February, I um, was working, a f I worked 12 hour shifts, and I worked four 12s in a row, four day shifts. And I, I remember going outside and then walking back up the, the uh, slope sidewalk and being really short of breath. And I thought, what's going on? Like, have I got a cold or, you know, I was a smoker. And I thought, maybe I'm smoking too much or I better stop smoking or whatever. And then it happened the last day again. And I felt really, really, really tired. Like, I didn't, it, I wasn't myself. But I got through the shift, and that night I didn't sleep very well. I slept all day the next day, and I went to my sister's in the evening, and I was there a few minutes, and I said, I have to go home. Something's wrong. And she goes, well, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. I couldn't eat. You know, I'm diabetic, and I, I was really worried about that because I felt nauseous. So I went home, I went to bed again, <laughs> And I got up in the morning, and this part I don't remember, but my husband told me about it, is that I got up and I was vomiting all over the bathroom, in the sink, in the toilet, in the tub, really violently vomiting. And I do not remember that at all. But I remember telling him, I need to go to the doctors now. And he told me that I made an appointment. <laughs> I can't believe that I stopped to make an appointment. I obviously wasn't in my right mind. And uh, he didn't know why I was saying all this stuff. And he just went with it because he was scared. And we went, it, he said it took me 15 minutes from the house to the car to get in the car. And then he got me to the doctor's and I came in the door. The doctor looked at me. He was coming out at that time out of a room. And he screamed, call 911. And he set, came up and he grabbed me. I almost fainted and he put me in a chair. And the ambulance came and all I can remember about that is that they were kept saying she has no blood pressure, she has no blood pressure. And I kept saying to myself, I'm still here, I'm still here, like, don't do that, you know? And I was trying to figure out by how far we were going, where I was going. I remember that, but I wasn't able to talk. I, I couldn't speak. I thought that was weird. So when I came in through the ER at Chervinsky, uh, all the doctors were there and I knew them all, which was very reassuring. <laughs> you know, when you're scared, I was very scared. I didn't know what was going on I, and I knew it was bad. They said, don't worry, madam, we're gonna take good care of you. You know, and I said, what's going on? They said, well, you have pneumonia. You know, and we don't know much more than that. So um, I was put in the cardiac unit and uh, because that was the only available bed and I, I guess I had some ST changes on my ECG and some ischemia and I had no blood pressure and uh, obviously at that t time they found out that I was septic. I don't remember a, a lot about the initial home thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think that I was that ill that I didn't know because <laughs> that's the first time in my life I didn't realize I was sick, that sick. I could tell when other people were sick, and I could tell when I was sick, and that completely floored me. I had no idea. It came on so hard and so fast because I was working very hard at work, and then at just my last day and a half is when I started to notice it. So that's where it all started. Well, the experience with all the doctors I knew, and even some of the ones that I didn't know, was fabulous. They 
were absolutely wonderful to me. They always were asking me, what could we do to make you feel better? What could we do to make this better? What could we do to make you more comfortable? Yeah, they were, they were absolutely incredibly awesome to me. And um, I really liked the fact that I knew them, but it didn't matter if I did because even the ones I didn't know were really wonderful to me. And there were so many really brilliant doctors. Who, and I had every service looking after me, you know, because, I mean, right to nephrology and cardiology and um, internal medicine. I had everybody. <laughs> even uh, the when I had the bed sores, I had uh, problems with my coagulation, sweetologists. It was crazy. I think I had every doctor, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and again, uh, if without that, I don't think I would have survived, honest to God. When I went to this um, last meeting with uh, the students, it kind of scared me because I realized how bad it really was. Because I, you blow it off because you made it, but when you hear about the 90% chance of mortality, even with all the best doctors and all the best everything, it doesn't always work out that way, and I know that. But I didn't think about that until it hit me at the last conference how bad I really was and how lucky I was that I lived, and how lucky I was that I was in a great hospital with great staff, you know. I don't know, I was very stressed, and I had, and I worried about everything, and I wanted everything to be perfect, because I was so afraid if we didn't do this or that, that I would, I would go backwards, or I could die. I was very morbid, I think, about it. And, um, my sister, Deb, was there every day, and she was overlooking everything that was being done and reassuring me that, um, when I was awake. I, I should mention that I wasn't awake for quite some time. Probably three months, I, I don't remember, because I had to be sedated because of my lungs. My lungs were so bad that uh, they had to actually paralyze me and sedate me so that they could ventilate me so I know that that had to be done but again like I don't remember any of that as a patient um, it was hard to be in bed and not able to do what I previously had been easily I could easily do I used to watch the people in the hallway walking and wish I could walk I would see people going to the shower and wish I could go to the shower and like all the little things in life that you you take for granted you can't have for the longest time and it, that, that really is upsetting and frustrating but you have to keep your eye on the prize you know I was I had to say to myself every day I'm so lucky I'm alive I can't believe I made it through that and I just have to say, drive on. Leave that behind and just keep going, you know what I mean? Try not to um, let it get in your way. And then, because if you do, then it'll take either longer or you might not succeed. And I knew that because I have seen it with my own patients. When they give up, you know, they may die. If they fight hard, <laughs> they could likely live. It's half the battle. And I knew that. And I, used to, and I had my family behind me. I don't think being a patient is, uh, it requires a lot of patience. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, there was good things about it, a lot of good things about it. And there was some bad. I, I mean, there's always gonna be bad everywhere. You know, where um, I had uh, difficulty breathing and uh, they wouldn't answer the bell. So my, uh, twin sister was going to go get them but I was afraid I would stop breathing I said don't leave me it was the first time I went to the ward and uh, so she phoned my sister Deb and Deb phoned the doctor 
who was on call, because she knows him. And they came running in, and I was having a respiratory arrest. And they were helping somebody else who was having a cardiac arrest. So they that scared me. That really, really, really scared me because I thought, oh my God, you know, what if I didn't have Deb? What if I didn't have someone to call, you know? So I realized how important family is being there for you when you're in the hospital so that, that those little things, well, that wasn't so little, but anything that gets not taken care of right away, they can make sure it does because I was unable. I couldn't get out of bed, I couldn't move, I couldn't get up. I rang, we rang the bell and it, everyone knows that, it happens, they get busy. And uh, it happened to me too, so that was the only bad thing, which really scared me. Um, originally I was admitted on February 26th, 2015. And it was in midday. And uh, like I said, I spent a lot of time in the ER until they uh, gave me tons of fluid, they got my blood pressure up and stabilized me somewhat. And then there was only a bed available in the CCU. So I went there. I was there for approximately a week, but I got worse. Um, became more unstable. My lungs were filling. Uh, they couldn't, they had to intubate. And they sent me up to the ICU. <clears throat> I stayed in the ICU for over three months. And uh, during my stay there, twice, I, I initially I had pneumonia with sepsis. And then I had co coagulation disorders. I had renal failure, um, which came back on its own initially, and then I got um, I had trouble with lines because all my veins collapsed from so many lines and from sepsis, and they had to put a central line in, and the central line got infected, and I got septic again on top of the initial sepsis, and that's what almost took me. It was very, very, very scary for that to happen and, and I was told even after that not too many people survived two bouts of sepsis in one stay so I was it was kind of a unique situation which I never want to do again but um, while I was in, in the ICU I had multiple up to 15 pumps of drugs going $1,500 drugs being given to me multiple antibiotics and I ended up having uh, dialysis and uh, quite a few times and then um, I guess about three and a half months in I started getting better they could see I mean I had a, probably about a month there where everything was really shaky and they were worried and they were calling the family in and and they were um, worried but they always said but I think she's going to make it, you know, Be for whatever reason, I don't know. They never really specified, so I'm not sure. But I had gotten that far, so they pro they figured I'm probably going to make it now that I've gotten this far. They uh, were taking too long, taking my tube out. I was on um, PEEP of 5 and pressure support of 5, and that's time to take the tube out. And I'd been on it for like two weeks, and I said to them, take it out, take it out, take it out. But they were so afraid, because of everything that had gone on, to rush it. And, well, I took it out myself. And I know it was because of the medication I was on, because I hated when my patients pulled their tubes out. <laughs> but I did it. I'm sorry. I did it. I admit it. I wished I hadn't but I did and I held it to them I said and and before I could even like I said to them just let me try I just said that and whoop they put me out and put it back in and it came out probably several days later and I was good from that point on I did but my oxygen saturations never really they were 89 90 
at best. And that kind of worried me. I thought, well, it's COPD. You know, have I got so much damage? I had multiple different bugs in my lungs, like terrible stuff. I had herpes and I had fungus and I had everything in my lungs. And I don't know how I ever, I mean, I'm so happy that I can breathe without oxygen. But it took a while. That was my long course on the step-down unit because I couldn't get off the oxygen and my sats were, when, especially when they started to walk me, they would really dip down to 85. And I thought, oh, this has got to get better. So then physio became involved and they were wonderful. And they did all that, showed me all the things I needed to do to improve my lung expansion and my strength of my lungs. And I knew all that, but I was still on a lot of medication for, because I, I don't know if I mentioned I had a bed sore on my head. I had a bed sore on my, a huge bed sore on my bum. I had one on my heel. And I also, initially when I got up the first time, they dropped me on the floor. <laughs> Yeah, accidentally and tore all the ligaments and muscles in this arm. I'm still working on it. It's not perfect, but it's coming. Oh, yes, and then I had to go to the floor for the second time and I was having panic attacks about that because the last time I had a respiratory arrest. And I'm not that type of person. I've never had a panic attack. I've never had anything like that. Any ever in my life. And I literally was screaming, you're not taking me out, you, you can't do this to me, and gave me some, some more sedation, <laughs> and calmed me down, and then they put me on a, a couple of new drugs to, to help me through that, and it worked, antidepressant, and some clonazepam, and I settled down, and I was good. I, again, it was very scary being on the ward, because you don't have someone there all the time. But I asked to be put in a room with four people, so at least there was someone else in there. And that made me feel better. And you know, it, it turned out that I was looking after the people in the room and not the other way around. Because it's just the way it works out. You know, I'd say, oh, let me get that for you. Oh, let me do that. Oh, don't climb out of bed. You know, I ended up being part nurse, part patient while I was on the floor. And that helped me get better, helping other people. You know, and then I started moving more and getting up more and wanting to get up more and wanting to get out, you know. And by July, the beginning of July, so from February the 22nd to July the 2nd, February 26th to July the 2nd, 3rd, I think it was, I was discharged home. And uh, it was the best day because I knew I was getting out and I was well enough to be home and I felt well enough to be home but I was still very, very, very weak and li literally I'd lost all my muscle strength and lost all my most of my mobility. I could get up to a bathroom back. I couldn't go long distances without a walker and I had trouble sleeping because I couldn't get comfortable with all my sores and stuff like that but yeah. I'm where I am now. I can sleep wonderful. I can get around. I'm just working on my strength and my, my agility now. So there is hope. <laughs> Lots of it. You just have to work hard. That's all. It's hard work. And it is. But it's worth it. I've come a long way and my family reminds me of it constantly. Look how far you've come from last year. And I go, you know, you're right when I get upset because I haven't got exactly where I want to be yet and I go yeah you're right you know I'm not in the hospital I'm at home I'm enjoying my life you know I can't do what everything I want to but it'll come you know I have to be patient I have a PSW every morning who comes and helps me um, in the bathroom because um, I have trouble getting down really low I've had several falls because my muscles aren't as strong as they need to be, I think. I found that out the hard way. I fell, hit my head in the, into a doorway. I've fallen in a closet. I've fallen, hit the night table. I've fallen in here. It's okay in here because it's a nice soft carpet. I just, I can't, I have to be, my balance is obviously off because of my strength. So I've learned that now and 
you know, you just work with it until it gets better and work on your balance, which I have. I go see physiotherapists um, twice a week. I see an osteopath once a week and I see a massage therapist once a week. And I see my doctor every week, if, if, if not every two weeks. And um, I was seeing specialists and I actually had a, a nurse coming in and doing my dressing every day, right up until um, just after Christmas. That's when it completely healed. So that was really awesome. Yeah, it was a, it was a great Christmas present. <laughs> I think, especially my, my sister Deb and my twin sister had post-traumatic stress. Absolutely. Because they had a hard time sleeping. They had a hard time looking at me. They had a hard time even coming over to see me when I came home because it just brought it all back. It was very hard on them. My mother too, my mom's going to be 82 at the end of this month. And it was killing her to see me like that. But they all just suck it up and say, you know, we got to do it for Mad. And all my friends, all my cousins, all my aunts, neighbors, everybody. I had people praying for me like you wouldn't believe. This one woman who didn't even know me, who knew a friend of mine, she had a church doing 36 prayers a week for me at 36 different churches in their whole thing just you know kind of thing and I uh, that's a big part of of how I feel like I got through it all the prayers and it wasn't my time God said not yet you know we still need to hear you still have something to do you know and um, yeah it was my uh, my brothers it really really rocked them they were terrified because they don't really understand the medical field and uh, they shied away but they did come they came probably half as much and you know they make themselves come because they, they were afraid that I wasn't going to be there you know and then when I got better then they were more comfortable coming whereas the sisters were there like the whole time and they didn't care but now like I noticed when I came home my sister Deb, who was there every day, was exhausted, and she, I thought I killed her. <laughs> you know, she used to spend every single moment with me. But she said she wouldn't do it any different. She said you couldn't have made me go home. I wanted to make sure, and I said, "Well, I." She goes, "I know you do it for me." And uh, our house seems to be that way. You know, our family's like that. If you need somebody, they're there. You know. And they were all there, and it's important because I, I even in my delirium, I did have quite a bit of delirium. I was saying, nobody comes to visit me, and I said, my sister Deb never visits me, and she was never away. My husband said she's there more than you are. You know, that's how much she was there, really. And I, it was just my state of mind, and I knew that afterwards not at the time I just felt bad for myself and I'd cry and carry on and, and or get on the phone when I could that was the best part when I could add my phone and I could call people why aren't you here I need you here and then someone would come you know what I mean because they were all getting tired it was a long haul it was you know four months over four months and uh, it's a long time for any family to you know give up that much time every night every weekend you know during the day on your days off you know but they did and I and they all said to me that I had done stuff like that for them already you know we all do that we all do it for each other and that's important and especially in your recovery you need your family badly and if they don't come oh boy it's a lot longer road let me tell you because it's, you need to know that they they care, especially when you're not in your right mind, <laughs> or you're delirious like I was, or or even just so sick. You know, you need your family. I think that right now I am probably three quarters to what I was. And that's kind of being kind. 
because I can do so much more. And I, at this point, I can't go long distance. I walk from here over to the doctors and some days I can't make it back. I have to call my husband because I just can't. I don't have that energy. Endurance, that's what it is, it's the endurance. Um, I want to do it, but I know I can't because then I start getting wobbly and you know, I don't want to fall on the cement. I've had enough falls so I don't take any big chances. I, um, my strength is very far off. I cannot close my, I cannot grip my hands closed yet. Um, yeah, it's not contractures. I found that out from physio. She says it's just weak, weakness. And we do a lot of exercises for that. And that's something that we're going to do more of once we resolve my shoulder. My shoulder, I can only lift it up to here. Um, I can't um, carry things with it. They fall out of my hands. It's almost like a stroke, but it's not. We've already ruled that out. <laughs> but I honestly did. I thought this left side was weaker than my right, which it is anyway, because you're if you're right-handed. But it seemed really exacerbated. It was way worse than it should have been. And um, I think that I was, my, my arm was hanging a lot because I didn't use it because it hurt. And um, at this point now, I mean, I can do things around the house now, which I couldn't do. I can I can go up and down the stairs. I couldn't do that for the longest time. And um, I'm sure soon I'll be able to do my all my bathing by myself. I just can't get down real low to my feet and stuff like that. It just, I just I don't want to fall. So. When I feel comfortable doing that, I have a chair in the shower. When I can do that by myself, then I'll, I can not have a PSW. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want to rush something that is going to take time. And everybody keeps telling me that, and I understand. But like you say, everybody wants everything to be better faster. <laughs> and um, I'm eating better. I couldn't eat at all when I came home. I was a terrible eater. I lost a lot of weight in the hospital, almost 70 pounds. I lost all my muscles. I, I, I had a lot happen. But I'm getting my muscles back. I don't. I used to have flabs of skin on the back of my legs that, that used to be muscles. And it scared me. I just went, what is that? Like, I've never seen that, you know, once. I never, in the ICU, you don't see the patients for that long of a period for that to happen. You know, they either don't make it or they move on. So I didn't expect that, you know. And same with my arms and my strength and everything. It was just kind of like, wow, it's a big thing to do, to lose. And it, I, because of the length that I was unconscious for three months, I lost it all. Um, I wish there was some something that... Um, maybe passive range of motion and all that, maybe something that could have helped me not lose so much. But I was so unstable that they couldn't move me, and I understand that. So it's not like there was an option. So, But if there is, you know, use it, <laughs> because it's a lot to get back. And I hope I get it back. I'm pretty sure. Everybody says I will, but I, uh, I'm not there yet, but... I haven't given up yet. Yep, yeah, I'm happy. I'm a lot happier uh, where I am now. And it is possible, regardless of what happened, that you can get through it and you can get to... If you, People who get to where I am would be happy. But I had much more, so I, I want it all. <laughs> I do. I really do want I want it all back. And they said I could, so... Well, that's what we're working for. We're working towards. For all the patients and patients' families and anybody involved with people who have sepsis, um, me, myself, I can tell you from um, just as a person and as a nurse, as a person, I suggest that you spend all the time you can with that family member and tell them that you're there. Tell them that you, you want them to live. Tell them that 
you're going to be okay. And the doctors are taking care of everything. Don't worry. Like, just positive, positive, positive. Because it is very scary. It's, I, and it's scary for the families, too. But don't give up on them. Because they really do need you there. It's important. And I, especially at my own experience, if my family wasn't there, it would have been way, way more horrible experience than what it, what it was. It was already horrible. It was, they made it that much better because I knew that they would take care of me and they would watch over me when, because nobody's there all the time, you know, and it's important that you, you another important thing is that you take turns because I felt that my one sister, she was there every day and it, it just wore her completely out. Um, that's who she is. And she wouldn't have given that up, but she should have taken some time off. But she was afraid to, because she was afraid that something would happen, you know. And that's just her personality. So I couldn't have, I told her to go home, but she wouldn't. And um, I had a big enough family that everyone took turns, and they did. But when I started to get better is when they really, really, really need you there too, because it's boring in the hospital and they need people to get them through the day and just just some kind words some jokes something anything just to get through that day and uh knowing that someone's going to come in you know the next day or the next day it it spurs people on you know and then my family would come and i'd say watch i can walk and I take my walker and I go down the hallway with them and they go, wow, you couldn't do that yesterday. And I said, I know, well, this is new. You know, and you wanted to, you need the encouragement. You need people there. So that's, for families, I suggest that. For the patients, um, <clears throat> when I was in the hospital, I made a list of things that upset me or, or I didn't like and what I liked that made me less anxious. I had an anxiety problem in the hospital. And so we made this list of things that I asked the nurses to do so that they wouldn't scare me or upset me or whatever, or be upset. And um, it was funny because the government people came in to assess the hospital and they saw it on my chart and now they're using it as part of the chart. So that was pretty cool. And they asked me and I had to sign and say that they could use it, you know, kind of thing. And the nurses liked it. So it also gives them a really good, um, I don't know, what's the word? It gives them a really good idea of who you are and what, and what you need without having to ask you. You know, it's so much easier for everyone. For me, the patient, the nurse, the doctor, everybody. So... Yeah, that was a really big deal that, that happened while I was in, and, and it worked wonderful, like wonderful for us. And also a, as a nurse, I, um, I like, f for the patients, I like to not leave them for long periods of time. I know, especially in an ICU, and I know what it's like there, I work there. But if they're, if they're saying to you, I'm very afraid and I'm very scared, then they have to do something, you know. Someone stays or someone says, I'll be right back or whatever. Be very reassuring to, to that person because it's a scary time. And I thought I was going to be all good. And I wasn't. <laughs> I'm just like anybody else. I'm not, just because you're a nurse doesn't mean you're going to be a better patient. You aren't. You're probably worse. <laughs> And uh, it, in the end, it all worked out, and uh, I learned a lot. And I hope that the patients and family learn something from what I just said, you know, that'll help them through any bad times that they may have in their life in the future or now. You know what? If I can give something to somebody, then after all they gave me, I'm going to do that. Like, because I can't physically do anything at this point. But maybe just with this.